So that is all of the announcements. I will now hand you back over to Chris, who will introduce okay. today's speaker. Man, the announcements are getting long, man. We're, we're blowing up. But um, <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. Really appreciate you, you know, spending your time with us. Um, so today we're lucky enough to have Graham Henson with us. He's a professor of geophysics at the University of Adelaide. Uh, his group runs the National Pool of Instruments, which is funded by the OWSCOPE, and they've been basically imaging the Earth from the top meter all the way to the lower mantle from Antarctica up to Greenland, so everywhere. And he's currently thinking about the possibility of using magnetotellurics on Mars in the future, so that's obviously very exciting. And he'll be talking about magnetotellurics again today, so whenever you're ready, go for it. Thank you very much, Chris. And look, I, I mean, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be invited to talk today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, magnetotellurics um, and how you might apply that to looking at a big mineral system rather than a particular deposit scale. Um, I'm the only listed author here, but of course, this is a big collaboration between many, many partners, uh, friends in state government um, across different states, federally, a number of universities, and I'll try to play uh, their um, uh, comment on them as we go through and uh, to uh, acknowledge their contributions. So um, when we think about mineral exploration, um, often we can sort of put an analogy in here as a sort of a looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, so the needle is obviously a very small object. It might have a particular attribute in this case it's, it's metal so you can pick it up with say a magnetometer but it's hidden in a much larger system and the much larger system in this case is the haystack um, so one of the questions that we've been thinking a lot about over the years is not so much about finding the needle but it's actually about finding the haystack so in terms of a mineral system this is really finding the source of the mineralization and for those of you who are based in Australia, you'll be familiar with this kind of landscape, but um, we have a very flat landscape. We have thick sedimentary cover. Where do you explore? What do you look for? How do you find that small ore deposit? And the question I'm gonna sort of show a little bit about this is, is looking not so much for the ore deposit scale, but for the source scale. So I've taken this uh, image from Graham Beck. Um, he basically describes how you might characterize a mineral system with different types of geophysics. And on the left-hand side is the lithospheric scale. It's the terrain or the regional scale exploration. And you can do that with techniques like seismic tomography, um, magnetotellurics, in this case, long period magnetotellurics, um, various seismic techniques and gravity. And then if we move up a scale into sort of crustal scale into a regional to camp scale uh, exploration, we can apply higher frequency MT, we can look at seismic reflection, refraction surveys and magnetic surveys. And then on the right hand side, we've got the sort of detection scale, which is the actual locating of that mineral system or mineral deposit. And I've got things like 3D seismics, gravity, magnetics, and AMT is audio magnetotellurics. So one of the things I can sort of see here is that there's a link between really deep, we can lose long period magnetotellurics to the crustal scale for broadband MT and for detection AMT. And you can apply it basically the same electromagnetic technique to characterize the whole mineral system. So a lot of this work is going to be based on a project which is known as OSLAMP. Um, OSLAMP is known as the Australian Lithospheric Architecture Magnetotelluric Project, or OSLAMP. Um, it's putting a long period magnet, mag, uh, magnetotelluric instrument every 55 kilometers or half a degree, roughly. And the map on the right-hand side shows approximately the density of sites we'll attain from that scale of survey. So it's about 3,000 sites. It started in about 2013, and uh, we are just over halfway through. So we're looking at getting an order about 100 to 200 sites per year. Each site takes about three weeks to collect, and we measure electrical and magnetic fields at the same location. 
And we determined from those measurements something about the electrical resistivity of the Earth and its dimensionality. So something about its change with depth and how it varies in three dimensions. So this is a map on the left-hand side from my colleagues at Geoscience Australia, showing the sites that have been completed and some of the green sites that were uh, in acquisition are now completed as well. So you can see that across the country, the red dots show the completed sites and most of the southern part of Australia and the southeast part of Australia has been completed. All of New South Wales, a large part of the Northern Territory and Queensland. We still have a lot to do in WA um, and then sections of Queensland as well. But our aim is to basically produce a national um, cover of magnetotelluric measurements from which we can derive something about the three dimensional structure of the Earth in terms of its electrical resistivity. So the uh, photographs I show on the right show some of the images of the collection of these data points. Um, you can see the sites um, or the equipment we put out. Typically, we use solar panels to power instruments over a number of weeks. Um, we're collecting relatively low frequency data. Many of the sites are only accessed by helicopter. Um, so it's a slow process to calculate or to generate these, this data set. And I'm just going to show you a few examples of the scope of this data set, and then we'll focus in a little bit more on the part of Victoria and South Australia that contains the gold deposits. So here's a, a, an image on the right hand side showing something we call phase tensors. Now, there's a lot of detail here about what these the color schemes mean and the shape of the ellipses. But basically, the, the blue regions or the blue ellipses show that the Earth is becoming more electrically resistive with depth. So it's more conducting at the surface, more resistive at the uh, deeper parts. The sort of the whites are sort of intermediate and the reds show things becoming more conducting with depth. So what we're mapping out here is large scale tectonics. We're mapping out sedimentary basins. We're mapping out cratons. We're mapping out orogenic belts. There's another way of presenting the data, and this is called induction arrows. Um, induction arrows are a way of pointing from regions of high resistivity to regions of low resistivity or to more conductive regions. So the bigger the arrow, the bigger the contrast. And you can see from these sweep of data, and these, this image was uh, generated before we collect, collected all the New South Wales data. Um, you can see sort of large scale patterns for example, in the Gawler Craton, um, the Gawler Craton is round here in South Australia. There's almost a pincushion effect where the arrows all point out from the middle. So it's very electrically resistive in the center and more conductive on the edges. Here again is these phase tensors. Um, and again, I've shown that the blue regions, the blue tensor colors show things are becoming more resistive with depth. The size and the shape of the ellipse show you something about the orientation of the electric currents in the ground. So the more elliptical they are, so the more squashed they are, the higher the concentration of current in one direction. So for example, around the edge of the Gawler Craton, you can see this very strong alignment of these ellipses, which indicate um, concentrations of electric current basically running around the edges of the more resistive cratons. But I'm going to focus in on the square here. This is the region of Southeast uh, Australia. This encompasses South Australia and Victoria. And I'm going to show it in a slightly different format here. Um, just to get your bearings here, I've highlighted the uh, city of Melbourne and Adelaide, where I'm at at the moment. Um, the black lines represent major tectonic boundaries and the Particularly, the Moistened Fault represents the boundary between uh, the Delamarian origin and the Lachlan origin. Um, you can see the white lines here represent the coastline of South Australia and Victoria. And down towards the southwest, we've got the deeper parts of the ocean. Now, what I've shown in this figure is both induction arrows, so they're the ones that point from resistors to conductors. 
And I've also shown the phase tensor ellipses, and I've included a lot more data here than we have simply from the uh, OSLAMP project. So you can see a higher concentration of data, and you can see that it maps out big scale variations in electrical resistivity. I've also indicated here the little white dots are gold deposits or, or got previous gold mines, and the yellow dots, which um, for example, around here, around Ballarat, and around Bendigo. These are significant gold mines with over a ton of gold production. So there's a strong concentration of these gold deposits. They're primarily orogenic gold, but there is some porphyritic gold, uh, particularly to the western side. Um, in this region, really, which stretches from just south of Ballarat to a bit north of Bendigo. So immediately you can see a bit of correlation between these phase tensors, the red regions showing it's becoming more conducting with depth and the location of the orogenic gold deposits. So what we've done is, and my colleagues from Geoscience Australia, Geological Survey of uh, South Australia, Victoria, uh, Geological Surveys of New South Wales, um, and our colleagues at CGG Electromagnetics, We've taken a whole lot of these data points, these MT measurements, and you can see them defined by these black dots showing the location of the long period sites. And the blue dots show the location of broadband magnetotelluric sites. And we put them into a three-dimensional inversion. So for those of you who are interested in 3D electromagnetics, all the details on the right-hand side, but all I need you to know here is we've essentially parameterized the Earth from including the topography and including the ocean to the southwest. And we parameterized it from the surface down to several hundred kilometers. And we've broken it up into lots of small uh, little voxels that we've then characterized by electrical resistivity. And the three-dimensional inversion basically inverts to find the best electrical resistivity that represents the same observations. So what I'm going to show in the next few slides are slices of that three-dimensional model. So we start off with the model at five kilometers. And just to get your bearings again, um, the square down in the southeast corner is Melbourne. We've got Bendigo and Ballarat and the gold fields. And again, the white dots are smaller gold mines. The yellow dots are the very large gold mines. The black dots are the long period MT. The blue are broadband MT. And then the white regions or the white lines through here is the coastline. And then the contours are 1,000, 2,000, uh, 3,000, 4,000 meters below sea level. Now, just to make it even more complex, I've added in the depth to sedimentary basins. And you can see these as these black contour lines down in the southeast part of the image. So this is the Otway Basin down in the south and the southeast, sorry, southwest part of the, the model. And that corresponds in the top five kilometers to very low electrical resistivity, so of the order of about 10 ohm meters. And that's what we would expect to get with regions that conduct electricity. Um, in sedimentary and pore fluids. By contrast, the sort of central part of uh, Victoria and South Australia are very electrically resistive, so something like three orders of magnitude higher. If I go to 10 kilometers, you can see much the same pattern. But if I go down to 20 kilometers, you can start to see this sort of change in electrical resistivity with depth. And there's two regions of interest here. There's one which is um, around sort of Bendigo. Um, there's a region that extends sort of roughly parallel to the Heathcote Fault. And it's just to the eastern side of where the big gold deposits are. There is another conductive region around the town of Mount Gambier. And this is actually where we have the most recent volcanism in Australia. So this is what's called as the newer volcanic province. So this is a, a 20 kilometer slice and probably the most uh, striking image here is the 30 kilometer slice through the earth. 
So this is basically slicing the model at uh, 30 kilometers. And these are contours of electrical resistivity. And you can see that the 20 ohm meter contour encompasses about 90% of all of those orogenic gold deposits. And, and really the central part, which is even less than 20 ohm meters, is coincident with the very large uh, gold mines. So we can see a very strong spatial correlation between lower crustal resistivity and the location of the major or uh, gold mines in Victoria. If I take the model down even further, this is 150 kilometers. And just to show you that the Delamarian origin and the uh, western side of the model, so um, the region to the west of the Moiston Fault is electrically quite resistive, it's bluer. So it's at the order of a few hundred ohm meters. And the Lachlan origin is more conducting. So it's about a hundred ohm meters or so. And we think this might be a, it's an indication basically of a step in the lithosphere. It's basically a change in uh, temperature of the lithosphere going from the cooler and thicker part over here in the Western side to a more newer part, which is a little bit warmer and has lower resistivity. Okay, so just focusing in a little bit more on that gold deposit region then. Um, so again, this is now a cross section, or sorry, a slice through at 30 kilometers. Just to give you a scale length, the tick marks at the bottom are 50 kilometers apart. Um, you can see the towns of Bendigo, Ballarat, and the bigger gold deposits as the yellow bigger circles, um, and the white smaller gold deposits. And you can see I plotted the induction arrows and they all point towards the best conductor or the, the, where the earth is more conducting. So the arrows on the western side point sort of downwards to the southeast and on the eastern side point towards the southwest. I've also shown a cross section from, this is known as the, we've got the Grampian line, is the line which goes from the west to the east. And what I'm showing on the right hand side here, this slice through the earth down to 60 kilometers. The moho is shown approximately about 40 kilometers. We show basically a very low region of electrical resistivity towards the central part of this gold province. So we see this very strong correlation. And um, one of the questions is essentially, how do we generate low electrical resistivity or very high electrical conductivity in the lower crust that's mapped towards the location of orogenic gold deposits in the upper crust? So we've been working with a paper by Damien, Damien Gaburi. Um, looking at the sort of the conditions and the um, parameters that are required for the formation of orogenic gold, gold deposits. So in the model of producing orogenic gold deposits in this part of Southeast Australia, the source rock is um, been sort of mapped to be uh, marine sediments that have high amounts of carbon and pyrite that have been compressed, thickened, as we've had the uh, uh, orogenic formation and the mountain belts associated with the Lachlan origin. So we know that if you take these rocks to high pressures and temperatures, they can produce a lot of fluid. And to get gold from lower crustal depths up to the upper crust, we need basically a very large amount of fluid produced that can be then moved from the lower crust to the upper crust without much loss. And the typical depths that that occurs is roughly about the green schist to amphibolite fascist um, depths of around about 20 to 30 kilometers and roughly about uh, 500 degrees centigrade. So one of the conditions as well is that we need to generate um, fluids by perhaps introducing an extra thermal input. 
Now, the, 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 the age of the orogenic gold deposits in Victoria is about 440 million years. Um, it's been hypothesized that at that time, there was a significant additional heat from a plume that essentially heated the base of the subduction system and rapidly introduced heat into the system, which we hypothesized generated this very large amount of fluid. So the barrier of rocks from the compression and the accretion of the continents is relatively slow process. Um, sorry, it's very rapid, sorry, but then the process of releasing the fluids is perhaps over a much longer time span. Um, the gold deposits then, the observation by Kerridge and Cassidy is that they've been formed essentially when the orogenic belt has formed, that the sediments have been thickened to the point where they reach amphibolite grade temperatures and pressures. And with the addition of extra heat at the base of the lithosphere, we can generate large amounts of fluid very quickly. So I've taken this figure from uh, Damien Gaburi's paper. And basically this gives us sort of a schematic of the process. So um, essentially we take these carbon rich, pyrite rich sediments that will contain a small amount of colloidal gold and they're buried quite rapidly down to um, 20, 30 kilometers as they're tectonically thickened. And then we hypothesize that an additional amount of heat perhaps from uh, a plume related activity at 440 million years, basically heats um, the, the base of these sediments and release a very large amount of fluid. So we're going from location two to sort of location three. So it's the position on the right-hand side from the map two, where we've got thickened sediments, and then we get an increase in temperature of those sediments at the base of the crust. So we're expecting here then to see that a lot of that fluid release has occurred in the lower crustal regions and then has moved upwards through uh, the crust along uh, existing faults and through hydraulic fracturing up to the surface to form the gold deposits we see today. So our hypothesis is that this lower crustal resistivity we're seeing essentially is the footprint of that gold system. So the mechanisms that we require then is we require a sedimentary system that is formed in a shallow marine system that contains a large amounts of organic carbon and pyrite. We then um, produce fluids out of them. And the equation here by uh, Andy Tompkins basically says essentially we're producing a ligand for gold and we produce carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide can be reduced to graphite at grain boundaries in a reducing environment. And we believe that the signature we're seeing is due to graphitic sort of films around um, uh, uh, sort of crustal rocks at um, amphibolite grade depths. So believe that the, what we're imaging here then is essentially the source of the orogenic gold, which is these thickened marine sediments that are at amphibolite grade temperatures and pressures. And at those temperatures with a bit of additional heat produce uh, carbon dioxide that was reduced to graphite. So we can test this hypothesis a little bit. Um, there is an existing seismic line along this region. Um, Ross Cayley will know this well. It goes across the Moiston Fault and the Avoca Fault and across the Heathcote Fault. And they can join these lines together, produce a sort of a, a structural interpretation. And just as a reminder, the Moiston Fault is essentially the boundary between Delamarian origin and the Lachlan origin. And the majority of these orogenic gold belts occur in the Bendigo zone between the Avoca Fault and the Heathcote Fault. So this is the um, 
structural cross-section uh, based on Ross Cayley's work and then modified a little bit by uh, Chris Wilson at the University of Melbourne. And essentially shows that the Heathcote fault bounds between the Proterozoic Selwyn block on the western side, on the eastern side, and then the Delamarian sort of Proterozoic continental crust on the uh, western side. And we have this sort of uh, uh, thickening of marine um, uh, uh, mafic materials and also sediments in these deeper parts. So I'm just going to show you the cross section here and how that relates to the electrical resistivity from the three-dimensional model. And I've sort of sliced through the three-dimensional model and then sort of put on the, uh, um, the interpreted seismic section. On the top, I've shown the location or the nearest location of the major or orogenic gold deposits. So we've got Morden, Bendigo and Fosterville along this region in the northern or the Bendigo zone here. And these lie fairly sort of right over the middle of this very conductive zone, which is somewhere between about 20 to 30 kilometers deep. And it appears to be sort of largely bound by the Heathcote fault and becomes more resistive as you move into the Selwyn block to the east. Um, along the surface, of course, we get the sort of sedimentary cover and that becomes quite conducting. And overall, the um, much of the upper crust is electrically resistive. Now, we don't have the same resolution as seismics, of course, um, and electromagnetic images tend to have this kind of blurry image. So we don't pick up the sharp boundaries. But what we do show, even from these um, really quite distantly spaced MT, is that the Heathcote fault seems to be a bounding process that we get high electrically conductive regions along there. Um, but the orogenic gold deposits at the surface are sited almost directly above the main and the most conductive parts of the lower crust. So there's that image again, a little bit more detail. And essentially, that's our uh, haystack. So we're looking for these needles at the surface, but the haystack is a much larger zone. It's, uh, you can see the bottom scale here, it's 50 kilometers between tick marks. And you can see a very large sort of footprint for these smaller occurrences of orogenic gold at the surface. So just as a summary then, basically, we see this very remarkable correlation between the major orog orogenic gold deposits in Victoria and the region of very low electrical resistivity in Victoria at about 20 kilometers to 30 kilometers depth below the surface. And in fact, the largest of the deposits lie within about the 10 ohm meter contour. So this is something like two to three orders of magnitude more conducting than the uh, lower crust to the east and to the west. We believe that the genesis of these gold deposits, um, and this is not our view, but this is quite widely accepted, is um, basically carbon and pyrite rich sediments that may contain sort of colloidal gold that have been both subducted and tectonically thickened uh, during the accretion of the continents. And we believe that the low resistivity we see is due to a graphite, graphite. It's basically a footprint of those fluid processes. We do just coincidentally see this sort of high conductivity or low resistivity around the um, newer volcanic province, um, which suggests that it's not the only mechanism. We don't simply see that graphite makes the earth conducting. And we believe that the NVP, the newer volcanic province, what we're seeing here is actually a temperature footprint within the crust. So look, my final slide is to say um, I'm delighted and really quite humbled to be talking to this quite um, wide group of economic geologists. And as a geophysicist, um, you know, I'm learning a lot about the economic geology and, and trying to understand our geophysical measurements in terms of a geo, yeah, geochemical and geological context. But we can look at it the other way and say that finding orogenic gold at the surface is actually an excellent way of finding lower crustal conductors. 
Um, so look, my thank yous are to many, many people. Um, many agencies have collected these data sets over 20 to 30 years. We've compiled them, we've added to them, we've reinterpreted them, but it does rely on a lot of people's efforts from many, many institutions, probably too many to acknowledge here. Um, we have a paper on this project. It's just been um, published in scientific reports. It's part of the Nature series of journals. Um, and I think there's a DOI um, uh, reference to this in the link to this talk. And you're welcome to contact me for any further details. So with that, I think I'll finish off and say thank you to everyone for um, being part of this seminar. And look, I'm very happy to take questions on it. While we do wait for questions, because none have come through yet, uh, I'll ask you some questions, Graham, because this is awesome. This is my, my little bit of a stomping ground, too. Not as much as Ross Cayley's, but I, I did dabble. Um, so uh, my first question is, when you're talking about the uh, lower resistivity at the source of where organic fluids are made, um, yep. did, do, is there a difference if a rock has pyrite or peritite when it comes to doing NT? Or, or is that just too small to matter? Because I know when you... Um, dehydrate basically at the amphibolite boundary, you break down pyrite to peritite. I didn't know if that would affect anything to do with resistivity in a rock. Are they very different when you make that transition or not? It's a very good question, Chris. And, you know, one of the challenges we have with deep magnetotellurics is understanding the, the mechanisms that generate high electrical resistivity. Um, you know, we have very little way of testing those hypotheses in the sense that, over the years, people have hypothesized it might be uh, fluids, it might be um, sulfides, it could be graphite, and so on. Um, in terms of your mechanism you're talking about and pyrite and pyrotype, um, my understanding of the literature is that the sulfides and, um, really do not have such a big influence on electrical conductivity over the scale lengths we're seeing here. And really the only mechanism that's been demonstrated um, essentially through outcrop has been that you need graphite to conduct over hundreds of kilometers. And the, the, just to give a scale length of that conducting region, from the sort of southern region of Ballarat to the sort of a little bit further north of Bendigo, we're looking at something like 150 to 200 kilometers. So to conduct over that scale length, we need something that really connects in a quite sort of efficient manner over that scale length. And um, I guess the consensus is that graphite is the most likely um, mechanism, but it's, it's still not definitive. If anyone would like to drill down to 20 kilometers, I'm sure Ross would love a, a very deep drill hole through uh, Victoria. Um, but it, it is quite difficult to test out some of these uh, ideas unless you have some mechanism where you can map it to the surface. Sorry, we, we, do have, we do have questions coming in. Ross, you're, you're, you're second in line here. Someone did beat you to the punch. And then you can, you can go ahead and have a second question. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to unmute uh, John Anderson, who wanted to, uh, to ask you a question, Greg. Am I unmuted? Yeah, you, we can hear you. Yep. Oh, good. It's working. Uh, hello, Graham. I'm in the street next over from you. But um, <laughs> yeah, I was... I understand the yield gain deposits are also classified as orogenic. Uh, do they show similar MT signatures? And um, whether they do or not, would there be enough carbon around in the Archean to explain the same mechanism? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. Um, when I first put a draft of this paper together, I sort of put it on the context of being all orogenic gold. And, and then the feedback from the reviewers essentially was, there was a lot of different types of orogenic gold and Archean orogenic gold may have a, quite a different sort of uh, mechanism than say the more uh, recent orogenic gold deposits. Um, my sense is, well, just to answer your first question, John, th th there isn't enough MT across the organ to really be able to define um, properties of the lower crust. So that's one of the great objectives of the Auslan program over the next say five to 10 years, would be to sort of map the entire part of Western Australia and to sort of perhaps look at those associations. But I think your second question about carbon is very pertinent. And without 
really understanding and knowing a lot about the Ilga and gold systems, my instincts are that we, without that carbon footprint, we may not see a carbon or graphitic type conductor in the lower crust. So um, even from the relatively few measurements there are on the Ilgarn, it's not a clear cut that there is a, a kind of similar type of bullseye around Kalgoorlie um, showing kind of a gold province and the gold connections. Um, so I think that, you know, there's still more work to be done on this, but my instincts are that it's probably as a different stage in the genesis of the earth that would give you a different carbon and therefore a graphite signal that we can map out. All right. So, uh, uh, Graham, do you mind putting up your end slide just so we have something on the screen to look at? Sure. Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then now I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute Ross Cayley, who I'm sure is keen. And he's, he's putting you on the economic geology spot now. He's going to turn you into an ore deposit geologist real quick. Great talk, Graham. Thanks a lot. It's really good data to look at. And um, I guess my question is, that low resistivity area beneath the Bendigo zone coincides with an area of crust that's really highly reflective, which is a, in, in the seismic reflection data, which is a big contrast to the seismic character of the metasedimentary successions that overlie it. And that reflective mm. pattern can be traced to surface in the hanging walls of Heathcote Fault, where it's been mapped as a five kilometre thick um, fault, single fault slice of mid ocean ridge, basalt, and on a night, which is early Cambrian and conformably underlies the sediment. And we can see in the seismic evidence that that package of rock, that oceanic crust, has been imbricated to occupy the whole mid and lower crust of the Bendigo zone. And that looks like the specific point of difference in the Bendigo zone versus all the other zones that don't have that vast orogenic gold endowment. So, for example, yeah. the stall zone doesn't have that. It's sediment dominated to the base of the stall zone. And yep. obviously the Melbourne zone is different as well. So I guess my question is, why do you think it's, it has to be the sediments? I mean, I, I get the geochemistry, but why do you think it has to be the sediments that are sourcing the world-class originic gold and not this specific point of difference, yeah. which is this vast <coughs> volume of, of igniphotic material in the lower crust? Yeah, look, it's a super good question, Ross. Um, and the, I mean, the answer is I don't, really no, in the sense that I can't say exactly obviously where the um, either both the gold signature and the electrical signature comes from. Um, my, I guess the question I don't fully understand is in that uh, mafic crust, is, is that the source of the gold or is the sediments above it the source of the gold? And um, I guess I've talked to different geologists over the last year or two and I've had different opinions. Um, but look, it is, it is an interesting question about, you know, mapping it more to the seismic reflectivity. And I agree that there is um, an ambiguity, I guess, trying to, I mean, our, our electrical zone certainly maps a little bit more into your, into the more mafic kind of crustal units. We have a little bit of a limitation in terms of our resolution, I guess, from an MT point of view that we've got, you know, 50 kilometer space stations. So there's a sort of inherent resolution issue but um i guess i'm skirting around the question here a little bit ross is that i i actually don't know what the answer is in terms of saying exactly where the source is i i guess we worked through a scenario of, of potentially being part of that sedimentary kind of package but i do take your point that they're the sort of the, the, probably the more conducting part actually really overlaps a bit quite, quite a bit with the mafic kind of crustal sequence as well I mean, I, for example, I, I get that you can get sulfur out sediments a lot more easily, the carbonaceous sediments, especially the pyritic ones. Um, and so there is an efficiency argument there in terms of the geochemistry and the, and the, and the sort of metamorphic cogenesis and stuff. But we would argue that you don't need efficiency when you've got like tens of thousands of cubic kilometres of basalt. And so what's interesting about the Bendigo zone is that when, when this crust was thickened at 440, there was no local subduction zone active. It's, it's actually more intraplate. So there's yeah. no 440 million year um, arc related to this shortening. The Macquarie arc terminates, it's, it's further north. And, and that's really interesting because where we see evidence for 440 million year old accretionary processes, so that's more in the eastern lock than fall belt, you don't have that enormous gold endowment. But what you do have is even more black shale. That's what's interesting, that the, 
the Bendigo zone actually hasn't got as much black shale as all the other zones, and yet it's got the most orogenic gold. So I'd argue that in terms of volumetrically, from what we know from the mapping, carbonaceous black shale is anti-correlated with the gold endowment. So while I take the point about the arguments in terms of the parogenesis, you know, there's so much carbonaceous black shale in eastern Victoria that it's, it's called a group, it's the Bendock group, and that group is absent in the Bendigo zone. Okay. It's really interesting. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, it's I'll a great it. ongoing <laughs> argument too. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one. I think, um, yeah, I know Ian Pitcairn's work is really insightful about that to look at what uh, elements could be sourced from basalts versus you know, sedimentary rocks, I guess, if you wanted to dive into that. But we do have another question. Um, we, this, this one's anonymous. I will not out the identity. But Graham, with the addition of more data collected in Australia, such as Central and Northwestern Australia, is it looking like the same correlation of conductivity and gold deposits? And is the depth level the same in that case? So are, are you seeing similar trends in other parts of Australia to what you see in central Victoria? We, we are in the sense that um, we, we can see perhaps not just simply gold, but certainly copper deposits. And we see a very strong correlation between um, conductors in crustal, lower crustal settings and copper systems, so including, you know, the big IOCG deposits in South Australia and the Olympic Dam in particular. Um, my sense is that, you know, what we're seeing essentially is that a, a conducting part of the lower crust is an overprint. It's naturally lower crustal rocks, silicates are not conducting. So they're, they're, you can't make them hot enough unless you start melting them to become conducting. Um, and it's hard to include enough fluid that's connected over very long time scales to make them very conducting. So you need something that sort of overprints um, the framework. So you either introduce heat from the bottom or you produce something from the top, but you need to change it in certain ways. So a lot of the signatures we're seeing, we see a very strong correlation between, say, a lot of the copper deposits we see through in South Australia and into uh, um, well, I guess particularly sort of through the um, edge of the Gawler Craton and very conducting parts of the lower crust. And we're trying to understand them. And I guess from a geophysicist's point of view, I spend most of my time trying to understand the geophysics and then <laughs> trying to understand the geochemistry is, is another stage on beyond that. But I guess the way we're thinking about it is essentially that something changes the lower crust and its heat and its fluids and it's not an unreasonable kind of um, outcome that where you have mineral deposits at in the upper crustal system are generated from lower crustal kind of conditions. And if you get everything right and you've got the right combination of, of minerals, then you can get a very strong conductor. And we see conductors, say, in the Kernamona province, which are more conducting in the lower crust than seawater. So remarkably conducting. So I guess to answer the question is that we don't see a necessary sort of one-to-one -one correlation. We see a gold deposit, we see a lower crustal conductor. I mean, the Victorian example is really quite remarkable. Um, but we do see a general kind of correlation between deep-seated fluid-driven magmatic processes that concentrate a mineral system at the surface and a footprint of that mineral system at depth in terms of electrical properties. And I guess our, our you know, challenge is to understand how do we use that in an exploration context. So it, it may be that with more data, we'll get a better and a, a, you know, at the moment we've got quite low resolution data, even though it's, it's still pretty good for the continent. But over time, we'll actually fill in the gaps. And it'll... There is a comment actually. Uh, so so um, basically from one of our, our founders, Tom, he can't unmute, but he re I'll read his comment out. It says, um, Turning it around, MT may be an interesting way to independently test the meta-sediment versus meta-volcanic source models for the Archean. I suspect you'd find the same signature as here. I don't know if you had any comments on that. Um, basically, I think saying that you can use this same method to test two different source models for, for Archean, one being meta-sediment or, or yeah. meta-volcanic. Well, look, I, I look, that sounds like a fantastic um, opportunity because... At the moment, you know, we, 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 
so the Auslan program, I guess, started to put the grid across Australia. And as we've expanded the grid across you know, many of the states now, you start to pick out those sort of regional patterns. But they've still got that limited resolution, both in terms of spatially and often in terms of the depth. Um, and I think one of the things we're learning from Auslamp is that when you can start filling in the gaps, you can ask more questions. So the analogy I often draw is if you started with a gravity program and you said we're going to map a new continent with gravity and you had a gravity measurement every 50 kilometers, you'd, you'd map out the cratons and you'd map out the sedimentary basins, but you'd see it as a blur from one coast to the other. And that's what we've got with MT at the moment. And of course, as you fill in the, the gaps and you get higher concentration, and as you move from sort of low frequency electromagnetics to high frequency electromagnetics, you sharpen your resolution near the surface. Um, I think we'll start to be able to answer those sort of questions about, can we distinguish between different um, models of um, economic mineral sort of systems? So I think this is sort of probably watch this space. Um, and I think there'll be more of this kind of work happening over the next few years. There's certainly a lot going on in Australia from states federally and through companies to put in large grids to sort of learn about not just the deposit scale, but the sort of source and the whole mineral system scale. Yeah, no, it's, it sounds like a very interesting uh, sort of area that could be explored in the future. Um, I was just going to ask the question about, um, you mentioned you mentioned about plume activity in this area. Now, and I don't know if this is going to be one of those sorts of uh, parts of the model, which, you know, is very difficult to test. But I, I was just wondering um, what evidence we have for plume activity in this area and, and whether or not you need it to, uh, to be able to generate the, the fluids acquired to move the, the metals to the upper parts of the crust. Yeah, look, my understanding is, of course, the 440 sort of million year old um, sort of orogenic gold system, we can map out over quite significant distances. And it is relatively well defined in time. Um, so the question is always with many of these systems is why don't we see them everywhere? Why don't we sort of see them continually occurring? And it may be that it's a combination of uh, a series of very um, distinct so, you know, situations, so the right sediment or the right crustal systems, the right compression, the right temperature, the right depth. Um, and the 440 sort of million year old sort of um, uh, sort of plume model, I think, has been uh, put up as a sort of an argument to explain why you see so many orogenic gold systems of about the same age. I think I would probably defer to Ross, <laughs> who would know a lot more about these kind of things than I do. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think the bottom line with these mineral systems is that they're not everywhere, of course, and they do require the right combination. And, and maybe it's the right combination also generates that electrical signal that, or signature that we can pick up in some places, but not everywhere. We, uh, we have another question here, and I, I super apologize if I say your name wrong, but I think it's Kiaming Kang, and I'm going to go ahead and unmute you again. Sorry if I said your name wrong. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it out. Um, this is more of a uh, economic geology question. Again, I think it's, uh, they're curious about the relationship between gold and carbon, especially graphite. Um, do you find the gold together with graphite? How important is graphite as an exploration target? Um, do, you, do you want to take a stab at that one? Thank you for your question. Uh, and it's a terrifically good question. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm probably not qualified in the sense to, to, uh, to answer that question in that I, I don't think we have enough data to be able to really address that scale of question in the sense that, you know, our, our sort of mapping I showed today is basically a big mapping. It's a big kind of footprint, but mm -hmm. trying to understand the actual dynamics of the geochemical system, I think would need um, probably a much higher resolution survey plus integration with um, seismics and, and just a, a, a complete characterization of the mineral system to understand exactly how the, those sort of, um, uh, how we might associate one system. I mean, we're not obviously going to see a gold 
um, effect in terms of electrical resistivity. So we have to see it by a proxy. And we've argued that graphite is the proxy in this case. Um, it's generated in the same kind of system. So it's a coincidental kind of relationship, but it has the same uh, source. Um, I don't think I can answer your question in probably any more detail than that, other than to say, I think this is, uh, these are really good questions to address and to see if we can use electrical methods to further kind of understand the sort of how these processes occur. I can, uh, I can add a little bit to, to the question for your curiosity is um, there, there is often origin of gold associated with graphitic shales. Essentially, they're a good reductant to make gold come out of a fluid, but it's not always the case that when you have graphitic shales, you're going to get an origin of gold deposit because we'd end up with a lot more. So there has been studies done on using them as, as indicator slate beds. And uh, sometimes they do indicate gold deposits. Um, other times they, they don't. They just don't always make a gold deposit form, but they are really great reductant for helping uh, deposit gold in these kinds of settings. They, they are really useful. They're just not a, uh, a smoking gun. I hope that helps you. Yeah, awesome. Well, we're bang on, I think, well, we're bang on nine o'clock in the UK time right now, which is actually the perfect time in which we'd like to kind of wrap these things up. So if nobody has any more questions, what I'd like to do is say a big thank you to Graham for his time today for a really, really wonderful and insightful talk. Um, something which I'm not as familiar with is the geophysical side of exploration and also just in general uh, mapping the subsurface. But it was a really, really well explained talk, Graham. And um, I think a lot of people got a lot of value out of that. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. And uh, it's, it's fabulous to connect to a different community because, you know, I can show all the MT images to the MT community. And of course, we all speak the same language and, and we kind of start and finish with the resistivity. So it's, it's actually a fabulous opportunity to talk to people about something other than just resistivity and what it means <laughs> geologically. So it's, it's a great opportunity, a great honor to be talking today and look thanks everyone for attending <laughs>